Hello? Everybody hear me okay? Yes, all right, we're gonna go ahead and get started. Um, my name's Devin Smith. I am an adult services librarian at the Longmont Public Library. Been there for about 10 years. This is my favorite job ever. I love it, thanks for coming tonight. I am excited to have Mr. Don Murray here with People and Pollinators to talk about pollinators and probably a little bit of people too. Yeah, so um, if anybody is a member of the Friends of the Library or knows anybody, we would like to thank them especially because without their funding, um, we could not put on programs like this. So if nobody wants to hear me talk anymore, I will give it over to Don. Thanks. All right, thank you. Can you hear me okay? Okay. Um, well, welcome. Thanks for coming out. Um, and thanks to the library for hosting this. Um, again, my name's Don Murray. Uh, if you have any questions, you can write down my email address there and, and contact me uh, afterwards. Um, I'm going to talk tonight. I, w I was reading what they had on the library website, and it says, well, they're going to tell you how to create a pollinator habitat. And I'm going to do some of that, but I'm going to talk about some policy issues and some things that what PPAN does. So PPAN is the People and Pollinators Action Network. And uh, so I'll go through a little bit of that, and then we'll, uh, I'll go over some things about pollinators in general and how you can help them, and then we can open it for questions uh, and answers. And also in the back there is Lyanna Street. She's, our, she's my buddy in all things PPAN. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about PPAN, our vision um, and mission. Um, our approach to protecting pollinators, because we are the People and Pollinators Action Network, and um, what the problems pollinators face are, and um, what we can do as people to help the pollinators, and um, then what you can do in your yard. So uh, PPAN is a Colorado-based organization, um, and we work to protect pollinators and people by advocating for strong policy at the state, le state and local government level, um, increasing habitat and improving the um, places that pollinators can live, and improving land management so that less pesticides are used, less poison is used, and we're uh, taking care of the health of the planet. Um, we work at grassroots levels. We do education. Um, and a lot of outreach. Uh, Lyanna and I are always somewhere um, tabling with events with all the handouts that we have, and you're welcome to pick those up. Um, and we work with different organizations to help the pollinators in Colorado. Um, so again, our approach, education, community events like this. Uh, we do webinars. Um, uh, there's one coming up next week, which I'll have in the presentation later on. Uh, we have fundraisers. Um, and uh, we have an educational summit um, in the fall. There's a pollinator summit, it's statewide things, usually down at the Botanical Gardens. Um, it's done in um, conjunction with the Butterfly Pavilion. Um, we do community mobilization, really trying to um, get people out and involved, um, working at the tabling experiences, um, and uh, we have partnerships with other um, organizations. And then uh, there's an arm of PPAN that does policy action. They do a lot of work with the legislature. We have a lobbyist to help uh, move things through the legislature, which I'm just starting to learn about. And it's like they always say, you know, it's like making sausage. You don't really want to see how things get passed. Um, but we do that through building coalitions with other groups who also are on for, for um, making, um, advancing things like clean energy, clean water, clean environment. So let's talk about pollinators. I, I do a thing every summer with kids, um, where, and the first question I ask is, what's a pollinator? So what's a pollinator? Great. Um, and they do, and, and why do they do that? What, do they, what does that do for the plants? Wind is a pollinator. What is, what is the moving of pollen from one plant to another get you? Fertilization, okay? So 
shortly before we know it, all the fruit trees are going to be in bloom and there are going to be all these flowers and something needs to fertilize those flowers so that they can turn into cherries and apples and um, um, peaches. That was the thing. I just planted peach trees and I'm waiting for one blossom. Um, so we need pollinators and um, pollinators come in all different uh, si shapes and sizes. Um, it's not just bees. It's um, moths, butterflies, um, beetles, hummingbirds, um, flies, even house flies are pollinators, which when I learned that, it's like, well, that's pretty cool. And I've actually seen house flies on my dill plants pollinating the, the dill. Um, but they're critical to maintaining a healthy, thriving ecosystem. And, um, oops, go back. They account for about a third of our diet, so a third of the crops that we uh, have in the United States are pollinated by, or need pollination of some kind. Um, and that's about 20 to $30 billion annually of um, um, agriculture that is dependent on pollinators. Um, and, but 80% of flowering plants in the world need pollinators to survive because if you don't if they don't get pollinated you don't get a new seed and then you don't get a new plant so the most popular pollinator that people know about are honeybees um, I'm a beekeeper um, and they are originally from Europe they're called the European honeybee and they're not native to America they came over in the 1600s I think it's about 1620 two that they landed in Virginia and they are um, prolific I'll say and so they have spread from coast from the east coast to the west coast in a matter of uh, a few hundred years um, and they are considered a managed livestock um, uh, species um, and Every year, the, the big news is they are shipped from all over the country out to California to pollinate the almond crops. California produces 80% of the world's almonds. If there weren't honeybees, there wouldn't be almonds. Um, and uh, so they're a very important species for our agriculture. And after the almonds, they go up to Oregon to, pop, to pollinate the blueberries. Then they go, some of them go back to pollinate the oranges in Florida, and they just get spread back across the country, and then next year in December, they all get shipped back to California again. But that's only one pollinator. Uh, another, po another set of pollinators are um, native bees. So in Colorado, um, it says 900. Anybody want to guess how many we actually have? A little more. 950, okay, so there's about 950 different species of, of bees, of native bees in Colorado. And in all of North America, I think there's only like 1,500. So we have a big chunk of native bees in Colorado itself. Um, and um, they come in all shapes and sizes. You'll see, well, I have a bee block in the back. They come from, you know, they, they nest in holes that are about you know half inch in diameter to something that's you know like a sixteenth of an inch in diameter. Um, they're bumblebees, squash bees, digger bees, um, leaf cutter bees. They're all um, just these native bees. And the thing about the native bees is they've evolved with the um, plants in Colorado. So there are some plants in Colorado that can only be pollinated by a specific native bee because the shape of the flower only allows that one bee to get in there. So you can't have a honeybee pollinating this little tiny hyssop plant. Okay, so they, 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 are, they are very important for our native plants. And why do we need, what, what's good about native plants in Colorado? Well, they're used to our weather, okay? So the lupins, you know, they might get snowed on in May. They still come back. The, um, the yuccas, all these different flowering plants that we have in Colorado 
are adapted to our season. So if you want to grow something that you don't have to take care of that much, grow native plants because they do well in this climate. But they're in trouble. Um, and both the honeybees, it's not just the honeybees. You've heard about colony collapse disorder and, and different things, and the, maybe the varroa mite. Um, but it's also the native bees. And it's a multifaceted thing of why there are problems. Um, big problem is pesticides, and I'll talk about that in a bit. There are parasites like the varroa mite on the honeybee. Um, there's diseases, deformed wing virus, and it spreads from uh, species to species. So we're seeing in bumblebees some of the same parasites and the same uh, diseases that we see in honeybees. Um, habitat loss, we build housings, and where do the houses, where do the houses uh, go? They go in the fields that used to have wildflowers and we used to be forage for the pollinators. Um, and then climate change. As the climate changes, things, um, you know, they have to adapt if they can. If not, they might move, they might move higher, but maybe the flowers won't move higher. So that's an, that's an issue for them too. And pollinator health um, is related to human health. Again, if the pollinators decline, we're going to lose some food sources. Um, as you said, there are some things are wind pollinators, but most of the things that are wind, are wind pollinated are grasses. So we'd have popcorn, we'd have oatmeal, um, we'd have some rice, we'd have some uh, wheat, but that's a pretty bland diet. We wouldn't have luscious peaches and oranges and watermelons and things like that. Um, so in terms of pesticides, um, when I talk about pesticides, I'm, I'm talking about anything that kills what we consider a pest. Um, herbicides, insecticides, fungicides, rodenticides. Um, and they became more um, in use after World War II. So after World War II, the, um, all these chemical companies had these nice chemicals that they would use for like... Uh, chemical warfare, you know, that they did. And it's like, well, what are we going to do with these now? Well, I know. We can use these on our lawns. We can use these to kill other uh, insects. We can use these to kill all kinds of things. Well, that has just exploded. And, you know, the older of us in the crowd remember DDT in the 60s, and that was sprayed all over. And then they go, oh, well, you know, it's not good for the bald eagles. It's really not good for us either. Um, but these pesticides are everywhere. The, um, it, it's used a lot in agriculture, um, but what happens is they're used to target a specific pest. Let's say the corn borer worm, right? But what happens is they also kill off the good, the beneficial bugs, because there are a lot of beneficial bugs. Most bugs are beneficial. Most um, weeds are beneficial, and they have this um, uh, side effect of killing the beneficial bugs. If you want a healthy ecosystem, you want the beneficial bugs and weeds to outcompete the bad bugs and bees. So, um, but overuse of pesticides, we end up killing everything. Um, there's just an article today I saw there are a bunch of um, organophosphates, I think they're called, that the FDA just put some restrictions on. And these have been used in, for years. One of them is diazinon. I remember my dad used to sprinkle like diazinon all over our, our property when I was a kid. And they just realized, oh, well, you know, it causes cancer in people. So maybe we better restrict how it's used. Um, there's another thing. There's an article uh, that I heard on the radio yesterday about PFAS. Um, I can't tell you what that stands for, but um, these are chemicals that were developed in the 30s and have been used widely, and now all of a sudden they're going, oh, well, maybe that's not a good idea. A lot of pesticides have only been conditionally approved, so, and the research that, approved, that they used to approve them is from the chemical companies. So is a chemical company going, oh, this, you shouldn't use this, this is, this is bad. Well, no, they're going to find science, they're going to find 
research that they supports the use and production and money making of those pesticides. Um, and what happens over time is they never get uh, totally vetted. And then 30, 40 years later, we find out that they're cancer causing chemicals. So um, what you want to produce is you don't want to kill things. You want to encourage the things that are um, good to outcompete and make a healthy ecosystem. That's my rant on pesticides. Um, I love this one. It's like scientists detected a 70% decline. like, thank God I don't live in an ecosystem. And the problem is, is well, well um, industrial chemicals and, and, or industrial agriculture using chemicals is a big issue. The, um, in, in homeowners are a big problem too. You know, you go down to the store, you buy some Roundup to kill a weed. Well, that Roundup goes into the soil and it kills the things that are in the soil too. Um, and now we're finding out that there's a link between glyphosate, glyphosate and cancer in humans. Um, but we are all in one big ecosystem. And so we need to make a healthy ecosystem um, to uh, benefit us and the pollinators. Tom Theobald was, um, started the Boulder County Beekeepers. He was a mentor of mine. And in the um, early 2000s, he started looking at the use of systemic pesticides. So a systemic pesticide is a pesticide that's put on a plant and it's usually put on the seed of a plant, like a corn seed, and then every cell of that plant has that pesticide in it. So when a bee, even though corn is wind pollinated, it, uh, the, the bees use the pollen. So when a bee goes to get the pollen off of that plant, it's got poison in it. And if you have 20,000 honeybees coming back to a hive, bringing in a sublethal dose of this poison, then the Poison just accumulates, it accumulates in the wax, it accumulates in the hive, and the hive dies. I used to have a hive out in, in Niwot, and when they put down the seed corn, and it, it came out of winter, it was doing great, put down the seed corn, bees went over, and they look at the dust and they think it's pollen, and they brought it back to the hive, and I open up the hive, and there are all these bees on the bottom just dying, so I don't keep bees out in Niwot anymore. Um, so, the, you know, the, there are all these side effects. And if you go to a cornfield in the middle of the country, it's, a, it's sterile. The only thing that's growing is corn. There are no bugs, there are no, uh, and they have to keep putting more fertilizer onto this, into the soil because they're killing all the good things that are in the soil. So I guess I didn't finish my rant. But Tom, <laughs> anyway, Tom um, joined a lawsuit against the EPA to fight particularly these systemic pesticides that were conditionally approved and, and try to get the EPA to um, unapprove them. Problem is, it's a money-making machine, and a lot of the people in the EPA work, used to work for the chemical company. So, so it's a, again, it's like the whole making sausage thing. It's, it's tough to change. All right, let's go on. Um, so again, in, in terms of our habitat, if you look at that nice green lawn on the upper left there, that's a food desert for pollinators. There's nothing there they can eat. Grass, they, they, there's no food in grass for them. There's no dandelions in there. My lawn would have lots of dandelions in it. Um, and then we spray all of these chemicals to kill bugs, to kill everything in these um, fields. And even though I'm ranting on pesticides, which I believe is one of the biggest issues for pollinators, there are a lot of complex things. Again, we need to eat. And big ag is the biggest thing that um, keeps us uh, with food. But we can do a lot together, and that's kind of what PPAN does. This is where we try and um, protect pollinators. So we do it through government action, um, as I said. We, uh, and some of the things that we've done, uh, I'll talk about some of these in, in more in a little bit. But we work with the legislature, we're working with the legislature on the 
Pesticide Application Applicators Act, which is going to be sunset. What it should be renewed, it should be um, uh, continued, and it should be strengthened to make sure that people, when they apply pesticides, are doing it legally and um, with minimal impact on the environment. Um, the governor's office, um, both um, Hickenlooper and Polis, um, declared June to be pollinator month. Um, we, we worked with them on that. Um, and then in local areas, I'll talk about that in a minute. So again, some of the things that we have, um, I-76, a section of I-76 was designated as a pollinator highway. And we worked with the Colorado Department of Transportation to have them stop using um, uh, pesticides along the stretch of the highway. And uh, we went out and planted flowers along that section of the highway. Um, we're, CDOT is doing something along um, the diagonal. If you've driven up and down the diagonal the last couple of years, you've seen these like race tracks. Um, we're not sure what they're doing because they went off and did that by themselves. But it was something that we really pushed for. Uh, pollinator license plate. Um, talk about that in a minute. And then um, doing these pollinator resolutions and creating pollinator safe communities. So here's the license plate. We have an example in the back. Um, you can get one of these for your car. I just got one on my truck, um, and I'm going to get one on my car soon. Um, you can do this, uh, give a donation to PPAN. It's anywhere from, I think the minimum is 25, but you can donate more if you want. Um, and then you get a little number, and then you take that to DMV, and you can get this nice little pollinator plate. And then you, you, know, you have to pay for whatever the extra fee is for a, um, a specialized plate. Um, and I actually got um, words on mine, so then it's uh, you have to pay even more. But if you just get this, the twenty-five dollar fee to PPAN is a one-time fee. You don't have to do that every year. Um, last year we got a um, we tried to get a bunch of other stuff done, um, protecting schools from pesticides, things like that. But the pesticide uh, industry is very has a very powerful lobby. But one of the things that came out of this was the General Assembly approved a pollinator study, a native pollinator study, which is just starting to get underway, just to document what, how many pollinators do we have, what's the, what's the health of these populations. And so um, this is an effort that's going on now. Um, again, with local action, um, I was just telling Devin that the last time I think I was in this room was we were pushing the city of Longmont to uh, create a pollinator safe resolution to stop using systemic pesticides on the public lands. Um, and we got that done in May of 2017. But in Boulder County, um, the city of Boulder, Boulder County, city of Lafayette and Longmont have all created pollinator safe resolutions to um, protect pollinators. Um, again, through community organizing, um, we have these local PPAN chapters. Lyanna and I head up the Boulder County chapter. Um, there's one in Denver. There's one in, in northern Colorado up in Fort Collins. Um, and we're trying to expand across the state to get other um, groups to organize to um, help protect pollinators. Um, we have webinars. I'll talk about some of that in, in the future. Um, and we have native plant and seed swaps um, and the annual pollinator summit I talked about. And let's see. We work with different partners. Um, these are other groups that have similar goals, uh, protecting the environment, protecting um, ecosystems. And um, uh, for example, the last one, Audubon Rockies, Lyanna and I, for many years before the pandemic, would um, go to their events and talk about pollinators while they would talk about how you can make your yard safe for be uh, birds. So in the end, it comes down to if we want to protect these pollinators, if we want to have these uh, healthy ecosystems, they need safe and abundant forage. And a lot of the forage 
around has been taken over by housing developments um, and we can but, and then those housing developments just put in turf grass which doesn't help the pollinators and um, but there are things you can do so I'll go through this list on the side I'll just point out that we have this is our the pea pan uh, Colorado pollinator habitat um, we have some of those signs um, their uh, donation, suggested donation, $10, but um, you can donate more if you want to get your own little sign. I've got one in my front yard. So, so the first things you can do is plant native habitat. So I talked about having native plants and why native plants are good. They're not only good for the pollinators, but they're easier to care for than uh, exotic plants or plants that aren't native. Um, we have a handout in the back for low water native plants for pollinators. PPAN is actually developing a new list that will be up on our website at some point soon. But uh, this one from uh, CSU and um, other groups has a really nice thing. You want to plant um, plants that will bloom all year. So you want some that plant that will bloom in the spring some in early summer, some in late summer, and some into the fall, because they need food all through that um, time. And especially the native pollinators, um, you know, they're not like honeybees. They don't store up honey to get them through the winter. They go out, they get some food, um, they lay an egg, they cap it off, and then they die, and then a new one pops out next spring. Um, but they need forage, they need food at the appropriate time when they're out um, foraging. Um, last year also, the uh, Colorado legislature um, passed a law for turf replacement, providing grants for turf replacement. Um, I don't know if you can see it there. I don't, uh, Devin, no. um, I don't know if these slides, but you can send me an email if you want, that, or just Google, I just Googled Turf Replacement Program Colorado, and you can get to this page. Um, but starting uh, this year, there are um, ways that you can remove your turf grass. The thing about turf grass is if you don't take really good care of it, it gets weeds, and then people apply pesticides to it. But um, it also sucks up a lot of water. I'm tired of having high water bills. So when I moved into my house, I put in this beautiful lawn. This is before I was all pollinator-y. Um, I put in this beautiful lawn for my kids to play soccer on. And now my kids are 25 and 31, and uh, it's just a water sink. So I've cut a big chunk out of it. And my neighbor said to me, he's an old guy, and he said, you paid all that money to put that lawn in. Why are you ripping it up? And I said, because it's costing me a lot of money now. So you can get rid of some of your turf. There are these turf replacement programs. Um, Longmont doesn't have anything yet, but um, we're working with local governments to help support grants so that they can um, pay people to remove their lawns and then plant native habitat in the SID. Um, eliminate... Um, Pesticide use, um, my story of how I got into this was that I was standing under my neighbor's um, crabapple tree. It had been full of meals. It's a beautiful tree. And we were standing there. This was about 2006. And you couldn't hear a bee buzzing. All these beautiful flowers. And, it's, and this is about the time the colony collapse was happening or was making news. And I thought, well, I got to do something. So the first thing I did is I stopped using pesticides in my lawn um, and or in my yard, my whole yard. Um, and eventually um, became a beekeeper, and then I got involved with pea pan. Uh, but it hasn't stuff still grows in my yard even without pesticides. Um, but that's a big thing you can do. Um, you know, I always think I always say that we're in a giant chemical experiment, okay? Putting all these chemicals out into the ecosystem. They haven't been tested. There's no control group that's saying, oh, well, what happens if you don't use pesticides? 
just like, we'll just put pesticides everywhere, we'll just put poisons everywhere, and see what happens. We'll get rid of some bugs, we'll get rid of some weeds. Eh, we might get rid of some people too, in the end. Not, they don't say that, but um, it, it, just stop using pesticides. There are other options you can have if you don't like certain things. Um, the money you donate to PPAN for the pollinator license plate, we're putting into a fund, and that's this um, Protect Our Pollinators Habitat Fund. And we just started that this year, and uh, applications are due April 7th. I don't know all the details of that. They're on the website. But it's a way that you can get money to create a pollinator habitat, particularly at schools, churches, whatever, if you want to um, uh, transform the landscape and make it safe, make a nice pollinator habitat. That's a way you can get some money to help you do that. Um, just some tips on creating pollinator habitat. Um, Leave the leaves. This is the time of year where everybody gets outside, starts cleaning up their yard, cleaning up all the leaves that have accumulated. But what you're also cleaning up is like the overwintering bumblebee queens that are lying under the leaves. So if you can, leave the leaves. I know like some parts of my yard I leave the leaves, some parts of my yard I clean up because I want to plant stuff. Um, but if you can, leaves are not litter. Also, if you have um, stalks from last year's plants, like coneflowers, you can just stip the tops off of that. Pretty soon the green will grow up. You'll never see the stalks. But there are, some, you, you can see in the back there, Lyanna has some uh, sticks that have um, native bee nests in them. And there might be native bees in there. You can kind of look around for holes, but that's um, something you can, um, so, don't clean up until the temperatures are above 50 degrees average. Um, don't mulch everything. I mean, we love mulch because, you know, it's a dry climate. We go, oh, we'll put down mulch, I'll keep the water in. But it also keeps the ground nesting bees. And 80% of native bees are ground nesting. It keeps them from finding a home. Um, so try and leave some bare spots. You can mulch some things. And, but just leave some bare soil where the native bees, and it's fun to watch them. They just kind of dig, dig their little holes. The little digger bees dig their little holes, and you see them popping out like that one there in the, in the picture. Um, they need water. Um, that's my little bird bath there in my front yard. Uh, but you don't want to just put out a bucket of water because it will drown in it. So uh, Lyanna in the back has a little plate. You can put a plate, put a little rocks in there, and then they can land on the rocks and take nice sips of water. You also get birds if you do it in a bird bath. And uh, they all sit there together happily. And you can make them native pollinator house. So I have one in the back, and, and we have the plan. So please pick that up if you haven't already. It's a nice, it, it has different size holes. just a block of wood. You drill a bunch of holes in it, and you just watch it. So this came from a, this particular um, design came from a project at CU called The Bee's Needs. And um, they would give you a B block, and they would give you a little notebook, and then every two weeks you'd write down what you saw in each one of the holes. And I did it with my little six-year-old neighbor um, uh, for like three different seasons, and it was a fun. It's a fun thing to do with kids. It's a fun, uh, they don't. Are, unfortunately, they ran out of funding, so they don't do it. But there, if you just Google the bees' needs, they have a uh, nice website where you can see the different plugs that go into each of the holes and, it's, and some of the research that they've done out of there. There used to be one out at um, Rogers Grove um, on one of the posts. When you buy plants for your native garden, um, make sure they're not laced with pesticides. Um, you know, if you go to Home Depot, most of those plants are laced with pesticides. Um, you can ask which ones aren't. Some of them are labeled, like I know McGuckins and Boulder labels there. Um, but there are be safe business, pollinator safe businesses. This is from the PPAN website. Um, under one of the menus, you can get to this. Um, and in Longmont, um, I know Flower Bin, 
they don't use it for the stuff that they grow. But if you want to go get a big bush, it comes from out of state, and there are laws regulating what can be moved across state lines and whether they have to be treated or not. So just ask. They're really good at the at the at the um, flower bin. Um, in Boulder, there's um, Harlequin Gardens. None of their plants have uh, have been treated with pesticides. And they have a lot of um, educational opportunities there, too, and as is the flower bin. Um, if you have a lawn care service, you can get organic lawn care, um, but vet them. Make sure that they are not spraying poison. My neighbor across the street, he sprays poison all over his, uh, every year, you know, however often they come. And one day I was out in my yard, and I was in my backyard, and this guy comes back and he goes, oh, you have a really nice yard here. We're here to spray your yard. And I said, what? And I went out front, and here's this guy. He's spraying my lawn or spraying my yard. He killed my, he didn't kill him, but all my pumpkin plants that I had grown out there, they all came out deformed. Um, it's not good stuff. And then, you know, you got kids, you got dogs playing on these things. It's bad. It's just, you're just making them swim in a toxic soup. Sorry, I keep going on about this. Um, and then shop at pollinator-friendly businesses. And again, you can get a list of them here. And then, you know, the other thing is, it's great to do stuff in your own yard, but it takes more than just a pocket here, pocket there. Um, we really need pollinator highways where Pollinators can safely migrate from up, up and down along safe spaces. Um, so, and that takes effort at the local and the state level. Um, on our website, so this year, this is the 2023 20, legislative efforts. Um, the, as I mentioned earlier, the Pol Pesticide Applicators Act, we have a statement on what we think should happen, but you can read the act, you can read the recommendations from the state on that. Um, another one is reducing barriers to waterwise landscaping and HOAs. That one I think has a good chance of, of um, I think it's, it's like 60%, 60, maybe even 80% of homeowners in Colorado live in an HOA. Um, I live in a place where there was an HOA in 1967, but Nobody enforces it now. So I can do what I want in my yard. But, you know, there are a lot of these HOAs have these uh, restrictions. You can't put down anything but turf grass. And, again, turf grass is um, just a food desert to pollinators. Um, you can become involved with PPAN, okay? Um, you can uh, volunteer. Um, we have a pollinator safe pledge um, that has, I will not use pesticides, and I'll try to plant for pollinators. That's all you got to do. And if you say, you, we can put your location on a map, it goes up on a nice map, um, and um, you can zoom in and see more and more people are. When I first started, I was like one of three of those little dots. And that's, that's only um, what, seven years, maybe, Diana, that we've been doing this. So um, you can you can do that, and that's easy. Um, we have pledges in the back, um, and then you can get involved with us, or you know get involved, or not not just necessarily get involved with us, but come to our our uh, events. We do need volunteers. If you know anything about gardening, or even if you don't need know anything about gardening, um, it's always just nice to have another body there to help and answer questions if you can. Um, so next Thursday, there's a webinar from PPAN. Uh, we're doing a lot via Zoom. Um, and this one is Community Science to Conserve California's Bumblebees. There was one last month on um, permaculture um, that I'd seen before. Um, there are uh, lots of great um, webinars. Um, we're going to have our next meeting. Lyanna and I are going to have our next meeting on uh, March 30th. We're still, might be at the library here, but I'm trying to find a place that's closer to Boulder so that Boulder people will come out. Um, 
and, and join us, but also be via Zoom. So if you haven't signed up for our um, newsletter, um, do so if you're interested in those, because that's how we'll announce where and when. On the 22nd of April, with, we do a lot with uh, Sustainable Resilient Longmont. Um, it's their Earth Day celebration. We'll be at Centennial Park with our tabling. We're always happy to have volunteers help us out with that. Um, but you can come down and talk to us more. Um, late May, uh, early June, we're going to have a safe plant swap um, down at Olin Farms, which is uh, off of 95th uh, Street and here in Longmont, um, where if you have plants, just bring them on, and that haven't been treated with pesticides, and especially if they're native plants, bring them on down, pick up some new plants. It's great. Last year, it was a great event. Um, there's one in Boulder, I think on May 20th, as a plant swap, but um, I think that's, I don't know who runs that one. But there's, uh, okay, Sierra Club. But that'll be announced on our, on our uh, newsletters. Um, and then there will probably be some more events in the summer, but we'll be at the Niwot Honeybee Festival in August. It's usually like the fourth. Saturday in August, and then the Boulder Bee Festival down at the Banshell Park in Boulder. Um, we're always there. That's a fun event for kids. Uh, uh, who's it? Paige and Jeff and Paige are there singing songs for the kids. Um, but there's all, you know, Harlequin Gardens is there. There's all kinds of information on pollinators and um, plants, and you can get a lot of your questions answered there too. And I think that's all I have as far as uh, my spiel. So I want to thank you all for coming. And um, please protect the pollinators. And thanks to the library again. Um, I'll take any questions you have. Uh, it is. There's no honey that does not have poison in it. Um, whether it's enough to affect humans or not, that and I, the research is out on that. But yeah, all, all honey has poison in it. Now, it, it, there's also some beekeepers use um, chemicals in their hive to uh, fight, us, particularly the varroa mite. Um, and um, that'll be in your honey too, but I don't. Yeah. Oh, I yelled at him. No. Yeah. <laughs> He's in my compost pile. That's legal now in Colorado. Um, he uh, he 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 had just started spraying because his friend was in the or, you know his colleague was in the back and I came running out. But he was just spraying the bindweed along the edge of my lawn. So most of the, he got the bindweed, but he got my pumpkin plants when they're about this high, which, yeah. And he went across the street. He, could, he said, well, this is, this is the order for your house. And I go, oh, no, this is eight, or this is five, or whatever. My neighbors across the street say, all right. So he went over there and just sprayed it in. I've tried to talk my neighbor out of using pesticides, but some people just, you know, in the 60s, I don't know if anybody, uh, you know, that used to have clover in your lawn. At least we did back east. And then they decided, no, that's, you know, everybody wanted a, a fairway with no clover. And so um, the, you know, people like Scott's and I don't know, whatever other companies, they found a market for their uh, stuff. And they um, just convinced everybody that that was what everybody needed. It was a nice green lawn with no weeds and dandelions. Um, and, and now it's you got to do four treatments a year, right? Everybody's got the four-step method for fertilizing your lawn. And it's like, you know, I, I used to fertilize my lawn with um, uh, Richmond, Rich, Richmond, I think it is, Rich Lawn, and they and because it was organic, it was like pig waste or something like that. And I've been trying to grow clover in my in my gar in my um, 
come on and spread it out. And then I was talking to, I was at the Colorado Native Plant Society um, meeting a few years ago, and I was talking to a woman who does organic lawn care. And she said, well, maybe you're putting too much iron on your lawn, and that's why the clover doesn't grow. So I stopped using that, and now I got clover. So it's amazing what you can learn. And that's the other thing is take advantage of events like this, or the, the Native Plant Society has a meeting in um, February every year get you all jazzed up for gardening. Um, the um, uh, Rockies Audubon has a bunch of online seminars. All these different groups have seminars that can teach you a lot more about, you know, if you have a particular thing or you want to do in your yard, or, you know, if you're on Facebook, join the, um, the Native Plant Society thing. It's, it's a great list. It's kind of overwhelming sometimes. I feel inadequate with trying to do stuff in my yard. But I'm going to transform a lot of my yard into native habitat this year. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Cool. I can get rid of my front lawn. <laughs> yeah, Tim. Oh, yeah. I meant to yeah, I was just looking at on the website today, and, and there, well, there was a seed swap event a couple of weeks ago, and, and um, but yeah, it's, it's great. And, and you know, if you don't use up all your seeds this year and you have an unopened packet, you can donate it to the library too. So a lot of time, it, it's, really, it's really great. Yeah, I, I use seeds. I've got seeds from 2016 that I got at an event a while back. No, they do have to go through government regulations, but if they have a pesticide, well, did it? Uh, no, that they don't have to go through whether it's toxic to animals. Or no, they, they do have to do a study. They have to fill it out, but they can use whatever science they have. I mean, you know, it, it doesn't have to be an in-depth science. It doesn't have to be in-depth research by a independent company. And so it's the... the it's generally the company itself that does the research. Yeah. Would you say otherwise? If you were Scots, you wouldn't sell anything. <laughs> but, um, yeah, it's a big problem. And, again, just the whole thing that a lot of people in the EPA and, and the pesticide area are former pesticide company VPs and things like that. It's kind of a revolving door. Once you get out of the EPA, you go to the pesticide company. So there's a, I'll give a spiel for this. So there's a, there's a um, thing that Boulder County is spraying on their lands called Rejuvra, and it's to kill the cheatgrass. And um, it was um, developed at CSU, and um, the guy who got his PhD um, researching this now works for Bayer. Um, and the bear has done a really nice job of selling this as a fire prevention um, uh, thing. Because if you have cheat grass, it, their assertion is, is that that will burn quickly. Well, there's no evidence that that burns any quicker than nat native grasses. And it's toxic to aquatic life. It's toxic to, well, we really don't know what it's toxic to, but the, the label says, you know, we'll kill aquatic life. And so um, when, they, when they do approve these things, they have to say what, what, what it'll kill. You know, toxic to honeybees, toxic to this, toxic to that. But that's just on a fact sheet, and, and the EPA decides, yeah, that's okay. 
Um, so we're trying to push Boulder County to stop spraying Rejuvra um, because it's killing the soil. It's killing the, the good things in the soil. I don't know if you've 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 read about how you know plants talk to each other through the soil. Um, it's kind of like um, Avatar. I always think of Avatar. You know, how the, the, the plants talk to each other, but it disrupts that. It kills that. It kills all the, the beneficial bacteria, beneficial um, beings in the in the soil. And not a lot of research is done what on what that I know of that what's done in the soil. Um, so we're trying to push Boulder County to stop using that. Um, but it's a tough sell because you go, oh. No climate change, we're going to have more fires. Don't get me started on that. I'm a meteorologist and I know the science. Um, but, you know, after the Marshall Fire, we say, well, we want fire prevention. Well, Bear says, look, we got this great product for you. We can, we can help you get rid of grass. And um, because they say, oh, well, it was the long grass. Well, the long grass was the native grasses. It wasn't the cheap grass. So... Um, so that's one of the things, that's another thing that we're working on now to work with the Boulder County Commissioners. But, you know, they've, um, for the most part, bought the uh, part of the, the chemical company's line. So it's a, it's a hard sell. Yeah. Where do you uh, get your irrigation system? Is it all from the farm? Um, I've converted my, my, Massive irrigation system that I put in when I put in my kids' soccer field <laughs> to uh, drip irrigation. So some of it I do drip irrigation, but that's only to get the plants started. So this year, a lot of the plants are well established, and I'm not having to water them. You know, like the, the and some of them aren't native plants, so I do go around hand watering. Um, but yeah, that's a good system. So you can convert your irrigation system to. They have converters. Um, Basically, I've, I've just like shut off the sprinkler heads and then I have one sprinkler head that I just come up and put a, a pressure reducer on and then um, it, uh, it just feeds the drip system. Um, good question. Any other questions? I do a variety of plants. Um, there is a program called, um, I don't do buffalo grass. It seems like it's really hard to do buffalo grass, but I, I don't know. <laughs> actually, if you go to CSU, it's like spray Roundup all over your grass, kill the existing grass, then plant the buffalo grass. And so I, I'm not going to do that. Um, but maybe if, if Longmont would pay me to rip up the grass, I was thinking about getting a sod cutter and then just putting down Soil. So uh, one of the things about native plants is they like really bad soil, you know. They don't like a lot of um, organic material. And, you know, things like I was just reading, I have a strip along my, my driveway that I've had beautiful butterfly bushes and a lot of iris is mostly what's in there. And I'm going to rip that up and make it a, a native uh, pollinator thing. And they say, well, you know, dig down three inches, and then you put squeegee. Do you know what squeegee is? It's like little tiny rocks. You put squeegee in there, and then rototill it in to about six inches. And then, um, you use, then you top dress it with squeegee. Because if you go hiking in the forest, there's not much organic material out there. It's a very dry, arid climate. And um, it, 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 they, they don't, you don't need really good soil. The other thing they said is you could just, like, dig out a spot where you want to put the plant and just put the squeegee in there if you don't want to get rid of that full area. But, um, yeah, so it's, that's, um, and again, we, we have the list of native plants up there. What's the, what's the uh, garden in a box? There's a group, if you just Google garden in a box, uh, resource, cent, resource central. If you go there, they have the different garden in a boxes and they show you what, and they, they're probably sold out by now because they, they, they sell out really quickly, but they show you the different plants that you can plant. So if you have a space that's like 8 by 10, they have an 8 by 10 uh, garden for you, and they, they list the plants that they would give you. And at 
Sometime, I think it's later in the season, you can actually get the plans and, you know, here, plant this one here, plant this one there. But I find that as a great resource just to find out what plants you might want. Because if you want one that has really tall at one end, and, and I might do this at my, in my yard, and, and slopes down to the street, you can get a garden like that. So that's a resource central is a good, good um, uh, resource. The, the, the one we have in the back here actually tells you, um, I'm not sure about the new one yet because um, I haven't really looked at that. Um, it just came out and we've been using this other one. Um, but I think it does it just tell you which uh, season it flowers in. We have plenty of those in the back too if you didn't get one. Yeah, please sign up for our list if you want to get um, more information on um, oops, on uh, any of these events, um, especially the TBD ones. Um, we'd love to have your help. We'd love to talk to you more about it. All right. Thank you. I love talking about pollinators.